the Bible, a book about faith, but also a book concerned with evidence. It even states what constitutes sufficient evidence. At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every matter be established. 1 Corinthians 13.1 I'm Derek Barefoot, and in three previous videos I showed that this rule, which I call the principle of confirmed testimony, applies not just to personal witnesses, but to declarations and objects that establish facts. I referred to a similar rule in science called the criterion of reproducibility. To begin our next study, let's look at another staple of scientific reasoning, the value of consilience. Consilience is the convergence of multiple lines of evidence on one explanation as opposed to others. For example, in the late 19th century, a German meteorologist named Alfred Fegner speculated that the world's continents were once part of a single landmass. Though others had suggested this possibility, Fegner assembled a scientific case. He brought together observations of topography, soil types, and fossils, all of them pointing toward the movement of the continents over time. Fegener was unable to convince the majority of geologists of the early 20th century, but consilience, like the testimony of many witnesses, could not be brushed aside. After Wegener's death, not only was his insight confirmed, the shifting of continents became the basis of plate tectonics, the explanatory framework for all of modern geology. Besides illustrating the value of consilience, Wegener's hypothesis is a convenient metaphor for what we've already discovered. Land features unexpectedly shared across expanses of ocean led Wegener to infer that the continents had a common geographic origin. In this video series, we've uncovered patterns that extend unexpectedly between books of the Bible. These patterns indicate a unity that transcends historical circumstances. In pursuing those unifying features, I've referred more than once to the 11th chapter of Revelation, and we need to return to it now. Revelation is the foremost example of apocalyptic literature filled with dramatic images. Readers will not understand its meaning unless they can decipher its visionary symbolism. We encountered such symbolism outside Revelation in the episode from the Gospels known as the Transfiguration. Alone with Jesus on a mountainside one evening, three of his disciples saw him speaking with Moses and Elijah, signifying that the Law and the Prophets, the Scriptures of Israel, bore witness to Jesus as the promised Messiah. In Revelation 11, likewise, we are shown two mysterious witnesses who are also called prophets. For three and a half years they exercise miraculous powers and strike the earth with plagues as they give their testimony. Finally, they are killed by a mysterious beast but after a short time, they rise from the dead and ascend to heaven. Special powers are credited to the witnesses, similar to those ascribed to the Old Testament characters Moses and Elijah, the pair from the Transfiguration. Revelation also says about the two witnesses that these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. Revelation 11.4 in the Old Testament book of Zechariah, the two men who oversaw the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, the Jewish governor Zerubbabel and high priest Joshua ben Jehozadak, are likened to a pair of olive trees. The description, two lampstands, recalls the messages to the churches of Asia just a few chapters earlier in Revelation. Of those churches, which are called the seven lampstands, only two received clean bills of spiritual health, those of Smyrna and Philadelphia. In other words, 
only two of the figurative lampstands were entirely faithful church witnesses. Finally, the killing of the two witnesses by the beast, which occurs, we are told, in the great city where Jesus was crucified, recalls the apostles Peter and Paul. Our best information is that both men were martyred in Rome, the seat of the mightiest empire the world had ever seen, at the hands of a beastly ruler, Caesar Nero. The crucifixion of Jesus, although it took place in Jerusalem, had been done in the authority and under the shadow of imperial Rome. The narrative of Revelation 11 therefore associates its two witnesses with godly pairs that extend from Israel's early history through the return from exile to the first century church, from Moses and Elijah to the apostolic churches of Asia. Therein lies the secret to the vision. Instead of being two literal persons who will breathe fire on their enemies, the witnesses represent, I believe, the entire body of Christ's disciples, from the days of the apostles to the coming of Jesus, a period that is symbolically, not chronologically, three and a half years in length. The faithful church is here portrayed as testifying to God's judgment, enduring martyrdom, and finally experiencing glorification. You don't have to accept that interpretation to appreciate the rest of this study, but I hope you'll consider it thoughtfully. As you'll see, it leads us to the next pattern that surprisingly unifies distant and disparate biblical documents. To see why, look at how ancient Israel is addressed by God in the Old Testament. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. Isaiah 43.10 Collectively, Israel could be called God's servant. But as we know only too well by now, testimony must be at the mouth of at least two. So while the word servant is singular, witnesses is plural. As this verse, along with Revelation 11, suggests, ancient Israel was naturally divisible into two entities. For several centuries, in fact, it consisted of two separate kingdoms, a southern kingdom known as Judah and a northern kingdom called variously Israel or Ephraim for its dominant tribe or Samaria for its capital city. According to the Old Testament, before there were two kingdoms, there were two parts of a united kingdom the house of Judah, and the house of Israel. We can trace the division back even further, all the way back to the first book of the Bible. Genesis says that Abraham's grandson Jacob fell in love with his cousin, Rachel, but in order to marry her, he was forced to marry her less attractive older sister, Leah, as well. Jacob came to have 12 sons, and at least one daughter, but the most prominent of the sons were Judah, whose mother was Leah, and Joseph, whose mother was Rachel. In following generations, each of Israel's clans, or tribes, claimed descent from one of Jacob's sons. Eventually, just three of the tribes comprised the majority of Israel's population. These were Judah in the south, and the two large northern tribes which bore the names of Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. One of the smaller tribes, Benjamin, occupied a narrow strip of land running from east to west that acted as a buffer between Judah and Ephraim. The city of Jerusalem, although its population was mostly Judahite, lay just within Benjamite territory. When Judahite King David moved his residence north from Hebron to Jerusalem, it was a political signal that he would be even-handed in his governance. Nevertheless, tension between Judah and the northern alliance led by Ephraim continued and led to division. Several Old Testament passages prophesied that in the fullness of time, rivalry would be replaced by brotherly unity. 
The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not trouble Ephraim. Isaiah 11.13 Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. Ezekiel 37:19. Judging from the book of Acts, the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled when, in the days of the apostles, descendants of Ephraim in the district of Samaria became fellow believers with Jewish Christians who traced their ancestry to Judah. The former rivals, even enemies, were joined together in a common faith. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 8, 14 to 15. The Samaritan people did keep the law of Moses, even though they did not worship at the temple in Jerusalem. They also attended their own Samaritan synagogues. The response of many of them to the gospel proved to be a stepping stone toward the conversion of Gentiles, non-Israelite people, of every ethnicity. That occurred just a few years later, as described in Acts chapter 10 and following. Because it describes the expansion of the early church outward from the Jewish homeland, the book of Acts is a story of conquest of both people and territory, conquest not by military means, but by peaceful persuasion as evangelists preached the gospel about Jesus. The apostle Paul himself, who plays a prominent role in Acts, describes his mission with a military metaphor. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and taking captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 Language about tearing down strongholds, even figuratively, cannot help but remind Bible readers of the Old Testament book about actual conquest, the book of Joshua. That's our next stop as we follow up on the two parts of Israel and the idea of two collective witnesses of God's purpose. Joshua is probably the least liked of Bible books since it narrates massacres of Canaanite people by the Israelites at God's command. So before we go farther, understand that Joshua contains an idealized history, simplified, abbreviated, even amplified to get across a message. Compare the way Jesus sometimes taught. Jesus commanded, if your hand or foot offends you, cut it off. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. He never explains what he means. He simply grabs our attention with a shocking image and leaves us to conclude that he was talking about rigorous self-discipline, not literal self-mutilation. I believe that something similar is true of the genocidal language of Joshua. Of course, Israelites overcame armed resistance to settle in the land of Canaan, but clues present in the text itself indicate that the language about massacres is a way to amplify in shocking terms Israel's mission to destroy Canaanite religious shrines and make no compromise with associated practices, which included idolatry, sorcery, ritual prostitution, and child sacrifice. For a detailed treatment of the subject, see the articles section of our website at typologetics.com.
Acknowledging that the brutal language of the first few chapters is a separate issue, here our interest is in how the book says the land was apportioned among the tribes of Israel. Settlement was not quick or easy or uniform. The man Joshua, for whom the book was named, became leader of Israel after the death of Moses. Joshua led his forces into some areas without encountering serious resistance, and no fighting is recorded in those cases. These included the ancient north-central city of Shechem, even though hostility had existed earlier between its inhabitants and the clan of Jacob. They also included the city of Gibeon, some distance to the south, and a few others in the central highlands. It was not until decades later, according to the books of Judges and Samuel, that tensions in those areas boiled over into violent clashes. Sometimes a single decisive encounter was enough to pacify a region. Hostility in other areas took years to overcome. These included the south-central city of Jerusalem, the western city of Gezer, and many others. The largest and most powerful tribes, not surprisingly, received the largest shares of territory and were the first to establish footholds in their allotments. Joshua records the division of Hanan's heartland, the west bank of the Jordan River, in chapters 15 through 19. As we might expect, the first allotment listed is for the largest tribe, Judah, in the southern highlands. The second and third allotments are for Ephraim and Manasseh, respectively, the large Josephite tribes that would dominate northern Israel. Two smaller tribes had received land on the east bank of the Jordan, and the other seven were too weak to occupy more than the fringes of what was left over. The account summarizes, and they shall divide the land remaining into seven parts for the seven smaller tribes. Judah shall abide in their territory on the south, and the house of Joseph shall abide in their territory on the north. Here is confirmation that tribes representing Jacob's two prominent sons, Judah and Joseph, comprised the two houses or divisions of Israel. Many historians doubt the biblical story of the origins of the division, but the existence later of two closely related but separate Israelite societies in northern and southern Canaan is undisputed. I haven't yet mentioned an odd detail having to do with the allotment of land as described in Joshua. The first tribal land title granted to Judah in chapter 15 is preceded by a special gift of land to an individual in chapter 14. A man named Caleb, a tribal leader of Judah, is awarded a tract in the heart of the southern highlands. His special inheritance is matched by another individual grant that comes after all the tribal allotments are listed at the conclusion of chapter 19. That gift is to the man after whom the book is named, Joshua. He receives a portion in the middle of the northern hill country, in the territory of Ephraim, which is appropriate since Joshua was from that tribe. What exactly has this history to do with patterns that stretch surprisingly across biblical documents? We'll get to that by finding out why the allotments of the tribes of Israel are bookended, as it were, by special gifts to Caleb of Judah and Joshua of Ephraim. As the Bible book of Numbers tells it, 40 years before the events described in the book of Joshua, 12 young men had been sent to spy out the land of Canaan, one from each tribe of Israel. When the men returned to the Israelite camp, 10 of the spies gave a disheartening report saying that although the land was bountiful, the Israelites had no chance against the military might of the Canaanites. Just two of the men expressed faith that God would lead Israel to possess the land, no matter how strong the forces were that stood against them. 
The camp as a whole heeded the negative report, and as a consequence, the Israelites wandered as nomads for decades before returning to the land of promise. The two spies whose favorable report had been rejected during that earlier period were those representing Judah and Ephraim. As you might have guessed, they were none other than Caleb and Joshua. God promised that because of their faith in him, they would survive to enter Canaan. Not only did they survive, but as we've seen, they received special gifts of land that bracket the allotments of the tribes as a whole. Joshua of Ephraim and Caleb of Judah not only proved to be a pair of faithful witnesses at the time of the spying out of Canaan, but by representing the northern and southern halves of the nation, the house of Joseph and the house of Judah, they formed a microcosm of greater Israel. They were an early example of a faithful remnant, a few people who cling to God despite the faithlessness of others and who experience his deliverance. When Revelation chapter 11 personifies God's people as two witnesses, it recalls Joshua and Caleb just as surely as it does other pairs, such as Moses and Elijah, and the great apostles, Peter and Paul. Our most detailed profiles of Peter and Paul occur in a narrative of peaceful conquest, a kind of spiritual version of what the book of Joshua describes. Peter is the central character in the first part of Acts, in chapters 1 through 5 and 10 through 12. Paul is the focus of chapter 9 and then chapters 13 through the end of the book. During certain events within Acts, Peter is paired with John the Apostle and Paul is paired with Barnabas. In the larger context of the book, however, Peter and Paul are paired with each other by their joint dominance of the storyline and by their powerful works and speeches. Each of them heals a lame man in dramatic fashion. Each mediates the gift of the Holy Spirit. Each performs vicarious healings. Each is given a mission through a revelatory trance, and each raises a person from the dead to give a partial list. Peter, like the other 11 original apostles, was a Jew. The word Jew comes from the name Judah, and with the exception of priests and temple workers from the priestly tribe of Levi, Jews are presumed to be members of the tribe of Judah. That's what we are left to assume about Peter. What about Paul? In Acts, Paul is called a Jew, which accurately reflects his cultural and religious identity. In his letters, however, Paul gives a more technical definition of his ethnicity. He says, For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Romans 11.1 1. Circumcised the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, Philippians 3, 5. Paul seems to prefer Israelite and Hebrew to Jew, even though elsewhere he acknowledges the Jews as his fellow countrymen. He claims to be of the tribe of Benjamin. I noted earlier that this small tribe occupied a strip of land between the territories of Judah and Ephraim. When Israel split into two kingdoms, Benjamin elected to remain allied to Judah. However, Benjamin the man was the younger brother of Joseph. He was the only other natural son of Joseph's mother, Rachel. As a consequence, the tribe of Benjamin was originally of the house of Joseph. For example, in the Old Testament, we read about a man who lived during the time of King David. And Shimei, the son of Gera, 
a Benjamite, came down with the men of Judah to meet King David, and said to the king, Behold, I have come this day as the first of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my lord the king. 2 Samuel 19, 16-20 At least two other passages, Numbers 2, 18-24, and Psalm 80, 1-2, place the tribe of Benjamin firmly in Joseph's domain. Benjamin became a splinter of the house of Joseph that remained attached to Judah. Peter and Paul, like their Old Testament counterparts, Caleb and Joshua, are from the houses of Judah and Joseph, respectively, and received, as it were, separate territories. In Acts, Peter does his work in Judea and in the coastal cities of Joppa and Caesarea. Paul preaches briefly in Jerusalem, but then ranges north and west, from Asia Minor to Greece, as he establishes churches which include many Gentiles. We have in this surprising pattern a token of the continuity of the people of God from Israel through to the early church. In theory, the author of Acts might have invented some incidents in that book or fictionalized bits of history. The author could not, however, have invented the standing of Peter and Paul as the leading apostolic witnesses of the early church, nor the division of mission territory between them, nor their association with the two houses of Israel, nor the comparison of evangelism to a military campaign. All those elements are present in Paul's letters which predate the writing of Acts. We already saw how Paul describes his work as an effort to tear down fortresses and bring ideas into captivity. He also refers to the division of the mission field between Peter and himself. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, or the Gentiles, was committed to me, as the gospel of the circumcision, or the Jews, was to Peter, for he who worked effectually in Peter for the apostleship of the circumcision was also mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Galatians 2, 7-8 He further refers to his allotted territory for mission work. But we will not boast of things outside our measure, but according to the measure of the boundary which God has apportioned to us, a measure to reach even to you. For we do not stretch ourselves beyond our measure, as though we did not reach as far as you, for we have come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 13-14 in the Articles section of the Typologetics website, I have posted a table of distinctively similar events that link the history of the Church, as told in Acts, with the early story of Israel, as found in the Old Testament. It's an impressive list, but again, the framework of correspondence is organic to the New Testament as a whole, not a scheme imposed by a particular author. Even the role of northern Israelite Samaritans in Acts as a people who stand somehow between Jews and Gentiles has Old Testament roots. One of the sins of the northern kingdom had been to seek security in alliances rather than in the Lord. God had accused them through one of his prophets, There is none among them who calls to me. Ephraim has mixed himself among the nations. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knows it not. And they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. Hosea 7, 7-11 The book of 2 Kings says that with the conquest of Samaria by the Assyrians in the 8th century B.C., 
foreign peoples were forcibly settled in northern Israel. For wanting to mix with the nations, northern Israelites were condemned to assimilate people of the nations in large numbers. But this also meant that God, who promised someday to accept northern Israel back into his covenant, would be accepting people of partly non-Israelite ancestry. First Peter sees the prophecy of the restoration of northern Israel as being fulfilled in Christ and applying even to Gentiles. I will have mercy upon her, northern Israel, who had not obtained mercy. And I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. Hosea 2.23 you Gentile Christians formerly were not a people, but are now the people of God. You had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 1 Peter 2.10 The division of Israel into two collective witnesses was dramatized anciently by the faithful men Caleb and Joshua. Then, hundreds of years later, it was expressed in the two great apostolic witnesses, Peter, who, like Caleb, was from the house of Judah, and Paul, who, like Joshua, was from the house of Joseph. Although the book of Acts divides spiritual territory, as it were, between Peter and Paul, it does not inform us that Paul was a Benjamite, and therefore of the house of Joseph. That information comes only from the letters of Paul himself. Like the cycle of the martyrs, which we looked at in the previous video, the apportionment of territory between Judah and Joseph confirms that the church founded by Jesus Christ was a continuation, expansion, and fulfillment of ancient Israel, the people of God. Please join me again for the next and final video on the principle of confirmed testimony. Far from exhausting what typologetics can reveal, the conclusion of that topic will point forward toward yet others and to more patterns that unify the Bible in surprising ways. For more information, find us on Facebook or visit our website at typologetics.com. Visit the Typologetics page at the Patreon website to find out how you can support the production of more videos like this one.